All right, good morning. Everybody have a good uh, weekend thus far? Good, good. Well, we're going to talk about a few things here. Uh, obviously, we've been going through the book of Acts. We're still there. This book is incredibly helpful to your understanding of God's Word and how it's laid out. And in it, it chronologically uh, kind of goes through in the beginning, and then it kind of has some jumping around here in the middle. Um, but this book is one that is really many times often misunderstood, but I'll tell you that many of the times when I'm having issues of correction uh, with bad doctrine in our Bible study, this is one of the first books we go to. And we actually start discussing Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4, and they start to, because a lot of the questions are answered in this particular uh, early stages of the book. Well, you know, I've been doing a little bit of reading this week, and this is going to be a kind of a split message on Acts chapter 6, but... It's also going to be a message about the Word of God and its importance. Uh, we had a Bible study this week, and it was very good. Uh, the two guys that I had been, uh, been ministering with and talking with, they came back, and they brought two other people. So there you go. That's always very good to have uh, more people show up. And it's also a testament to, hey, this guy's got something to say. Let's, let's get it out there. Let's keep, let's, I want you to hear it. I want you to go through it. So uh, I, did, I did finally uh, listen to some of the individual, uh, Chip Hardy is his name, from Indian Rocks. I listened to some of his messages. These are the guys over at Indian Rocks. There's about three or four of them who are teaching Right Division. And so I, I listened to some of their messages. So they're, they don't get any pulpit time, but they do get some uh, Sunday school time. And their Sunday school class is, is kind of growing, so that's always good. So uh, the guy, uh, Todd, who I've been telling you about, he brought his father, who's Todd Sr., so very interested and uh, eager to listen. I love when people bring notepads to Bible study because it means you really actually, you're like, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to write down some things. I'm going to go back and look some of this stuff up. And what I talked about was kind of the Word of God and, and some of the issues that people have with the Word of God and why it's not really a side issue. Uh, and it's not the very first thing I'm going to do is talk to you about the King James issue. The first issue I'm going to talk to you about is, is the gospel, the grace of God, and we're going to get you saved. Uh, but one of the soon after issues is, okay, so now that you're, you're, you're saved, now what are we going to be reading? What are we going to be studying? How are you going to get yourself established? And I know it is, it is today, it is one of those things, it's a taboo subject to talk about the Bible issue. Oh, you're one of those people. Why? Why? You know, why do you always have to do that? And if you kind of ever have read some of the basic material that we've provided on the, the, the controversies of the King James Bible, on the issues of uh, the modern translations, what is the translation that they're always, almost always compared to? It's the NIV, right? And so I get from people that I've talked to, well, that's not fair. Nobody uses the NIV anymore. Everybody knows that's just a corrupt translation. I've had people say that to me. So I say, well, really? Okay. Well, let's, let's pull up some statistics, and I did that this week, and I, I've actually been doing some reading. So uh, I, I got the Christian Booksellers Association. Here is their published list that they do uh, about every month or so of the best-selling uh, books in Bible translations. Of the Bible translations based on dollar sales, which one is number one? The NIV. Uh, based on Bible translations uh, on unit sales, which one is number one? the NIV. Which one has really been number one since its inception? The NIV. So therein lies why we always compare it to. So I actually had talked to some of these other guys this week, and I, I kind of asked them, I said, what Bible did you grow up reading? And they said, we grew up reading the NIV. And so I grew up reading the King James. I always did. Um, and, and my dad actually told me a very interesting story. I'll, I'll be at liberty to share this, I guess. But he was telling me about when Awana Clubs, which is, you know, the... Uh, uh, the Christian kind of Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, when they were looking at expanding the translations, the problem that they had was probably something you didn't necessarily think about. What do you think the problem was when they said, okay, let's, let's go ahead and let's do an NIV Bible in, inside the workbooks? What do you think the problem was? Verses weren't there, of course, but money. Money was the problem. Because they expected to get royalties from this. Are you familiar with the concept of public domain? I mean, I, I'm not going to, I'm not a, a uh, intellectual property by any stretch of the imagination. That's one thing that I, I, if you ask me questions about IP law or bankruptcy, I don't know anything about it. So, and taxation. I don't know anything about those things. Not really, but I, I just, I just never, I never talk about those things because I, I didn't really ever care for them. But I did do some research on 
uh, on IP law. And one of the things about public domain is that once it enters into the public domain, what happens? What happens? To it? it becomes freely, readily available. Anybody can publish it and do it. And so what you see here today in the King James, it is public domain. It's available to be republished and, and without any copyright attached to it. But I want to make sure this is very, very clear to you all. This is something that, that I've, been, I've been really going over, is, is the issue with the modern Bible translations, in order to be copyrightable, it requires something. You know what it requires? Change. How much change does it require, though? It actually requires a substantial amount of change, because they're called derivative works. In order for these derivative works to be copyrightable, in order for me to make some money off of it, I gotta make some changes. You know what the example is that, that many, uh, many are familiar with is, is the New King James. When they decided to make the New King James, everybody was very familiar with the King James. It was really the only Bible uh, that, that was you know, widely used. And all of a sudden you have them say, let's make the New King James and we'll just change the these and the thous basically and the yees and that kind of thing. That's what they were, that was really the intent and the goal behind it originally. Well, they did that and they applied for the copyright and they said, no, I'm sorry, that doesn't work. That's not, that's not enough. You need to change it, you need to change it more. And they're like, oh, okay. So as a result, they had to change you know, so many different things and had so many different words in order for them to copyright it to then do what? What ultimately was the purpose of it? It's ultimately is the purpose of money. I was talking to my dad about the Bible issue this week and uh, he, he agreed with me. He says, you know, the issue has always been and will always be about people's pockets. It's always about money, you know? And so when you really get down to it, uh, look, let me read you a couple things here. Um, Thomas Nelson, who's the publisher of, of, the, of the NKGV, uh, in order to obtain the copyright, they had to use, they started, they started doing multi-syllabic words and then more complex phrases to replace the simple words and simple phrases that were found in the King James. So their original goal of making it more uh, easily read and understandable was actually frustrated by the copyright law, which in turn created more money for them, etc. But the, the King, New King James is the third uh, most uh, sold version of God's word. But you know, as a general wor wor rule, uh, you have about 70 years that copyright protection expands uh, from the death of the, of the author, but there's a lot of other things that go along with that, and there's extensions as well. But you know, uh, the last thing I want to kind of mention about this before we dig in a little bit deeper is, you know, this isn't a side issue. Please, please make sure you don't just kind of roll over on it. Don't be like, ah, whatever, whatever. We'll just, it's not that big of a deal. If you want to read the ESV, that's fine. If you want to read the NIV, that's, that's fine. I mean, when people really want to get down to it, let's go start comparing some verses to it. Um, but one of the things that I've always, I've always found very interesting is, uh, again, these are facts. You can go online. You can look them up. You can go to the, the CBA's website and pull up. They're the Christian Booksellers Association. You can have the, 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 the material that they have, these fact sheets. But the, the publisher of the NIV, do anybody know who the publisher of the NIV is? <laughs> yeah, but Zondervan, right, who is owned by HarperCollins. Right? He, probably the largest publisher in, in the world, HarperCollins is. And so if you were to look at HarperCollins' works, just go on Wikipedia and look at who they own and what things they provide. And if you were to just, if you would start would read anything, I mean, one of the ones was The Pleasures of Gay Sex. That was one of the books HarperCollins publishes. This is one of the ones. Uh, another ones that they publish is The Satanic Bible. I mean, if, and, and I'm saying, why would you associate, if you're Zondervan, and Zondervan is the, we're an evangelical Christian, you know, organization, our goal is to reach the lost, and all that kind of stuff. Why would you associate them with HarperCollins? Why would you have anything to do with them? Why would your name even be remotely attached to them in any way, shape, or form? Well, this is what I talked about in Bible study, and I'll say it again. It's the covert versus the overt, right? Like, we can't be super overt in how, how Satan's going to work today. He's, he doesn't do that. He's as, he's as covert, transforms himself into an angel of light, and his ministers after the ministers of righteousness, right? So let's look and feel just like the original, but at the end of the day, we realize that it is a counterfeit. So why is it an issue? What is the problem? You know what the problem is? It's because, oh, you can't really know. I mean, really? It's, it's the issue of absolute truth. Everybody hates that. You're going to tell me that you know something? Oh, please. Come on. You can't know anything. What are we taught in society to today? What are you taught in school? What are you taught in college? You're taught to be just, oh, okay, I'm a leaf. I just flutter in the wind. 
I go to this thing, and that's fine. You can, have all, you can believe all that. That's okay. That's totally cool. Don't tell anybody that you know something that's truth. What's funny is you sit in the law, though. You sit in the legal classroom, and it's like, well, how do you say things like that? But the law really is, is supposed to be absolute. Well, you know the law is not absolute. It changes every other day, you know? Court ruling comes out, one judge finds this way, another judge finds this way. Regardless of precedent, regardless of whether or not it's binding on them, they still hold in various different ways, and that's why it's a testament to man's inability to make up his mind. You know, I read a uh, comic this week. It was on my the Christian blog. Somebody had posted, and they said, Christians, what do you think about this? And it said... I uh, had a picture of Jesus, of course, just you know, some make-believe picture of Jesus, a uh, really white guy with you know, blonde hair or whatever. And uh, he's sitting on the corner of, the, of a mountaintop, and he's talking to the, the apostles and some other people, and it's supposed to be the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, uh, now, pay attention, guys. I don't want four different versions of this going around. Now, I understand what they're trying to do. They don't really and understand uh, the, the different applications and, and the different uh, demonstrations of who Christ is in, in the, in the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I thought about that for a little bit, and people went a little bit further, and in the comments, people were like, yeah, if you Christians can't make up your minds, you have 18 different million Bibles, and they were just going through this whole thing. You don't even know what it is. And I realized, wow, what, what a... What a very interesting what a very interesting perspective from the atheist that they say this is what your problem is you can't even tell me what it is you believe and one guy will quote this and you realize what they do is they'll quote the atheist will quote well what about this version and what about this version and nobody ever there's nobody that takes a stand on these forms they just simply just oh okay well yeah well that's a good well, we don't really know and then they always ultimately have to go we'll have to go back to the greek and then i just go I can't, I can't take this. This is ridiculous. So let's, let's look at a couple of verses. Let's talk about a few things here that I think that you need to be really familiar with. You need to be able to defend uh, that it is what you believe. And you need to also be able to defend uh, the Bible. But the Bible doesn't need any defense, if that makes sense. You just need to know where to go in it to, to let it defend itself. That's it. It's simply where do I go to get the information that I need to give it to somebody else and say, okay, here you go. Here's the verse on it and go from there. And, I'll, and I'm going to share with you a couple examples as to why it's so important. Uh, before we begin, let's open a word of prayer. God, we love you. We thank you for your son, Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the ministry that we have. We thank you for truth. Uh, we thank you for love. We thank you for grace. Uh, and, and Lord, above all, we thank you for salvation and, and, and how, how uh, completely 100% free it is, Lord. As we study these truths today, Lord, help us to have an open mind and, uh, and a willingness to learn and, and uh, that we'll be able to uh, recall these verses in the event that we are uh, placed in a position in which, Lord, we have to stand up and give a witness for, uh, for what we believe. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I want to take you to uh, a verse in Psalm chapter number 12. Uh, Pastor Hargett has uh, gone through a while ago and he, he gave... Uh, he gave me a little Where is God's Word Today. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's a little, probably, 10-page little packet. Russ, do you still have some of those? Yeah. They're pretty good. I mean, I really, I really like that. I've, I've gone through that a couple times. It's very helpful. So some of these... Yeah, it's a full size. It's like an eight, it's like an eight and a half by eleven, and it's got probably ten or twelve pages, maybe fifteen, in there. And it's got some it's got some good kind of just basic basic information for you. It's not super in depth. It's not like manuscript evidence or anything like that. Uh, but it has some basic information. So let's start with Psalm chapter number twelve, verse six and seven. And I want to read this to you, and, and I want to make sure this is clear to you. Psalm chapter number twelve. It says, "The words of the Lord are pure." Words. Well, obviously, right? Is anything that comes out of the word of the Lord going to be defiled? Right? No, of course not. And how pure are they? He says, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Meaning, you're not going to find anything more pure than what? The words of the Lord. Verse 7, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Who's going to keep those words? Who's going to keep the words? God. O oh Lord, he's going to keep them. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation until the original manuscripts are gone. Is that what it says? I really want you to pay attention and, and look at that. Because in, in Christianity Today, I did do some research on just some different, uh, different websites, the church's doctrinal statements, and they all say it's inspired and it's in the original manuscripts. It's inspired in the original text. Well, you don't have them. Nobody has them. What then are you preaching? Well, I don't know. Hopefully I got something here, right? If God's word says this right here, I want to make sure this is very clear. 
If God's word says that he's going to keep them, if they're pure, Lord, pure words, and he's going to keep them, shall preserve them from this generation forever, if God did not preserve them, if God did not keep them, what would that then in turn make God? A liar. And let God be true and every man a liar. And as we know from Titus chapter number one, what? God who cannot lie. In hope of eternal life that God, which cannot lie, promised before the foundation of the world. God cannot lie. It's impossible for him to do so. So in this statement here, we have a decision, we have a choice to make. And we have to look at this and say, do we believe the words in the book that this is what it says and that God cannot lie? And I always, people say, well, maybe that one was mistranslated. And I always say, you know, well, well maybe Romans chapter 4, verse 5 is translated. Maybe it says, but to him that worketh really hard, right? Maybe that's what it really says. Maybe Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 actually states, for not by grace are ye saved. And that it's faith plus works so that every man may boast before God. I mean, really think about that. If you're trusting in words to get you to, to, get you to heaven, to get you eternal life, to be, have peace with God, to be justified, why is it then would you, would you pick some and say, well, these are important, these aren't important, the, oh, oh, this over here, that really doesn't mean that. Well, hold on. God cannot lie. And that's, there's, there's no other way this could be taken. So let's go, let's go through a, a couple pieces of, of information here that's, that's really important for you to understand. I want you to understand that God wrote the Bible, right? That is that man technically wrote it, but God authored it through inspiration through the Holy Spirit. And there's an important thing to understand here. Uh, look at Acts chapter number 1. Acts chapter number 1. Verse number 16. The apostles understood the importance of God not being a liar. And one of those, as I've always said, is the importance of prophecy being fulfilled. If prophecy is not fulfilled, that means that God is a liar. Does that make sense? Pretty straightforward stuff. And that's what the apostles state here in Acts chapter number 1, verse 16, in which they state, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Must needs. What does that mean? Must needs be fulfilled. It's mandatory. This thing had to be fulfilled. Why? It says, By the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. So the prophecy concerning Judas that David had wrote about, it must needs be fulfilled. Why? The Holy Ghost spoke it. That's God. And if, and if it didn't happen, that would make God a liar, and therefore what we are looking at would be room for error, room for problems, uh-oh, so I want you to understand these verses. Make sure that you have some of these in your mind as you're thinking through, well, how am I going to go about approach if somebody really, you know, if, they, if they're going to talk, I mean, you know, we've talked about how you approach individuals about God's word and how they question you. You know, if this guy is just trying to get a rise out of you, no thanks, I'm not going to sit here and have the argument. But if there's somebody who's weak in the faith and he's not doubtful of disputation, he's, he's, he's concerned legitimately about some issues, then you sit down and you talk to him about it and we go through these things. But if the individual just is not, is not listening, is, is not going through, Paul says you have to be apt to teach patient, right? And, and how do you look at that? Look at that verse with me in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. He says in verse number 23, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Well, how do you know if a question is foolish or not? Well, the more mature you are, the more instructed you are in the ways of righteousness and in the understanding of God's word, you, you know what a foolish question is. You know, you know what the, the fool is trying to get out of you. And he says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. How does that occur? That occurs when you preach the word to them. The word of God works in them. And what happens? Oh, light bulb goes off. 
I heard something this week that it broke my heart. My friend said, he was talking to his cousin, and uh, they said, well, we were out at this you know, wedding, and we were talking, and uh, we started talking a little bit about whether or not uh, my friend knew he was going to heaven and going back and forth a little bit. And he goes, you know, this all sounds really good and all, and I, and I want to believe, but my mind just won't let me. He's about 28 years old. Why do you think his mind won't let him do it? It's a problem, you know? These guys didn't have the verses either to get it going either. They needed it. They needed more verses. And the one thing that he said that was convicting, I'm sure, to my friend, he said, you know, the one thing that's always kind of turned me off about Christianity is what? What is it? Other Christians. That's what they always say. It's about you guys. I, I always used to see you guys. You'd fight and you'd bicker and you'd always do all these things. And I thought you were supposed to be different. They know they're supposed to be different. And I want to show you some verses today about that issue of being different through the Word as well and how the Word actually accomplishes that. That's the way you get sanctified through it, through the Word, which is truth. But look at a verse uh, just a couple pages over in Titus chapter number 1. I want to make sure you guys know these verses. You need to know this is a verse in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You need to know that verse. Titus chapter 1, verse number 2. Titus chapter number 1, verse number 2. But you know what's even cooler is if you keep reading through the next verse, what he goes into. He says the following. So in verse number 2, Paul says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And he says, But hath in due times, this means that in, in certain times it wasn't manifested, but he says, In due times manifested what? What did he manifest? His word. And how did he manifest his word? How, does he, how did his word become uh, presented, manifested, demonstrated, displayed? How did it become that? It says that he manifested his word through preaching. Hmm. And if you keep looking through there on the preaching, what's the next part of this? He says, preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Understanding who Paul is is very important because what was committed unto him is also committed unto you to go out and to do. Through preaching, he manifested his word through preaching. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 that what? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 with me. So Paul says, but hath committed in due times, manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. First Corinthians chapter number 9, Paul goes through and he tells you a little bit about what he preaches. And he goes, uh, verse number uh, 16 of chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this willingly, if I preach the gospel willingly, I have a reward. Ministry, service, judgment seat of Christ, the message that he, that he was presented with by the Lord Jesus Christ, by revelation, he continued to preach that. And he says, but if against my will, what is it? A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What's committed unto him? A dispensation of the gospel. The gospel of the grace of God. A gospel message that is so unique to him that he actually calls it three times my gospel. uses that personal pronoun. It's personal. It's my gospel. And as I've said, we need to take my gospel, we tell others that it's the gospel of your salvation, so that in turn becomes, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So we want to make our gospel the gospel of Paul, and then in turn, share others that it's their gospel as well. Let's go back to uh, Titus just for a second and read that verse again here. But hath in due times manifested, what does he manifest? His word. Not, <laughs> Paul, go out and just tell, just go talk about whatever you want to talk about. Have a good day. We'll see you later. Well, what do I need to say? There was instruction. Paul says the abundance of revelations. There's instruction that he has in what, she, in what he was supposed to preach. He goes far as to talk to you about that preaching. He goes, look, in, in regards to what's committed unto me, I want, to know you, I want you to know that I'm, I'm actually a debtor in that regard. It's committed to me to the extent that I owe it to that individual to preach it. I owe it to the world to teach it. 
And I, I hope you understand that we are to be followers of Paul, even as he follows Christ, 1 Corinthians 4, 16, and 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 1. And, and I know many people say, well, you know, man, how do, do we really know that much about Paul? Remember what Paul tells Timothy, you know, you've fully known my doctrine, right? In, in first Tim, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 10. Look at that verse with me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. He says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So Paul, in his message, in his preaching, he was met with opposition so many times. I mean, most of it, I mean, mo much of it came against because of the Jews, which were always so angry, well, this guy teaches people to worship God contrary to the law, right? Or whatever it might be. People who were supposed to be men of God, supposed to be the spiritual leaders, were the ones who were opposing him, the ones who were beating him up, the ones who wanted to have him killed. But through this preaching, just look over a couple more verses at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Through this preaching, through this persecution, through all the things that he goes through, the purpose of it, as he says here in verse number 17 of 2 Timothy chapter number 4, he says, Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me, what? The preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. What is he preaching? He's preaching information that the Lord Jesus Christ had given him. The information was the word of God. The word of Christ. And the Word of God is important. It's not something that is, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal. One of the major issues with Christianity is a, is a diversion away from the Word of God and um, an importance placed upon uh, principles. Right? Let's just get principles from God's Word that we can have application, life lessons. Uh, when I used to... When I used to pastor, I won't even tell you his name, but he was a pastor that we, we used to always follow quite a bit, and he would always, his, one of his big slogans was making the Bible more applicable. That was all he would always try to do. You know, uh, societies change, uh, issues change with the world, and so as a result, we need to, we need to have the word kind of change so that, and you, you're kind of realizing where he's going with this, so he says so we can make it more applicable to the people, right? Well, the problem of sin... <laughs> is the problem of sin. It doesn't change. It doesn't have any, you know, the problem of self-righteousness is the problem of self-righteousness that doesn't change. The problem of justification uh, by the law doesn't change. It's not going to happen. You know, it's these issues, but they try to fancy it up. They try to do it so that people can actually live life and try to somehow operate without putting the Word of God at, at the foremost. You're not going to operate in this world without the Word of God. You're just not. It's not going to, you're not going to be a, a, a Christian who will be able to fully operate without believing the Word of God. Because without believing the Word of God, you have nothing that can effectually work in you. So let's keep going through here a couple times. I want to talk about what Christ discusses, and this is not going to be a, a dissertation or a treatise on pres preservation by any means, but let's look at just a couple examples of what Christ discusses about the Word. So in uh, Luke chapter number 21, verse 33, 21, verse 33, Christ says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. I mean, if we're kind of bringing in correlation these other verses, he says the same thing in Matthew 24. Again, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, plural, shall not pass away. And we know that everything that God spoke, he also spoke it through Christ. Because as Christ stated, I and my Father are one, Christ says, you know, Verse John chapter 8, let me just read you a few of these verses. John 8, 28. Jesus said unto him, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. John 12, 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And then John 12, verse 50, and I know the commandment is what? Life everlasting, whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. 
And that's really the same thing how Paul operated as well. And that's how God operated with many of his prophets in the days of old. The prophets were told to go say a certain thing, and what did they go do? Okay, we'll go say that. Peter was instructed in what to say. He spent, Christ spent 40 days speaking to him pertaining to the kings, things of the kingdom of heaven in Acts chapter number 1. And he also told him, look, I'm going to give you a mouth of wisdom, which your adversaries cannot gainsay nor resist. And we saw evidence of that in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, where they were cut to the heart, and they wanted to kill these guys as a result of it, you know? The problem here is that it's, it's, it's a problem to, to not know God's word, and it's a problem not to understand the scripture. But you have to know where to find God's word and understand that God in Christ equates all of the scripture as his word, right? I get it so many times, as I told you with that uh, Episcopalian debate that I had with the, those individuals, they said, well, those are the writings of Paul, you know. Okay, well, are those not the writings of Christ? Did he not instruct in, 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 him in what to say? He did. He did instruct him by the abundance of revelations, right? And, his, and he goes, well, those are the words. I said, well, aren't the words that you're, re you're reading in Matthew of Christ really the words of Matthew, what he said Christ said? Well, no, those are really the words of Christ. And we go back into that argument, but that doesn't work because, again, everything is inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Man wrote it. God authored it. And it's very clear. I just don't understand how people can look at this and say, well, how did they write about these things? Uh, one of the things was crucifixion wasn't even invented, and we have people discussing about piercing feet and, and hands. And, you know, well, that's not even invented yet. How do they even know what they're talking about? Well, obviously, it's the prophecy aspect of it. And as you go through there and start reading more, you realize that, the book tells a consistent story. Obviously, we know the difference between prophecy and mystery. But look at one of the coolest, uh, one, one really good passage of Scripture that you need to know. Um, look at John chapter number 5. We'll look at just a couple of these here. These are great examples of Christ and, and how he discusses the Word. In John chapter number 5, start in verse number 39. John chapter 5, verse 39. This is just Christ discussing Scripture. And he's telling him to do what? He says, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. What testify of him? The scriptures testify of him, right? And he says, and ye will not come to me that ye may have life. Not that they cannot, but they have a free will to choose that they won't. And he says, I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If, if another shall come in his own name, him ye, sh ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses in whom ye trust. And he says, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Remember when Christ spends that time with the apostles at the end of the book of Luke, speaking them to them about the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, the things about Christ which had to take place? Remember when he talks about that? There are things in the law and the prophets and the Psalms that are about Christ that had to take place for the truth of God. And look at verse number 47. He says, but if you believe not his writings, if you don't even believe the scriptures, you're not going to believe my words. Why? Because he's going to equate here. You can look at uh, look at Matthew chapter number twenty-two, in which he equates the writings of Moses with the writings of Christ. He says the writings of Moses are the writings of God. Matthew chapter twenty-two. I know Russ hit up this verse last week. Matthew chapter number twenty-two, discussing the uh, Sadducees are, are interested in. They give him the ridiculous example of okay, this lady marries this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and then his brother. Blah, blah, okay, now whose wife? You know. It's like they're just trying to get the rise out of him. So what does Christ say? Jesus answered and said to them, you do err. And what's the problem? He says, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, what's this he do? He says, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? So something was spoken unto them by God that was recorded, that was written down, and they had the ability to look at what God said at any time in what they read. And we're going to look at the next passage here in Luke 4, which is one of my favorite passages on this whole issue. But look what he says. That which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. What was their issue? If you look at verse number 12, uh, uh, he says, saying, Master Moses said, I'm sorry, verse 24, saying, Master Moses said, right? That's the issue that they're always going to. Moses said, Moses said. They didn't equate. They had the problem of, well, it's Moses' writings. 
right? Not the writings of God, but God, God through Christ quickly corrects that issue and says the writings of Moses are the writings of God. So Luke chapter 4 is probably the single best example of this that I can give to you. That Jesus Christ, while he was on the earth, he never once questioned the Old Testament. He never corrected the Old Testament or the scriptures. He always quoted the scriptures in, in, in his endorsement of them, and that he always endorsed the scriptures as verbally inspired words of God. So look at Luke chapter number 4. I love this passage. It's so good. Just imagine being there and in, in, in reading this. And there's, there's actually a little bit you can get out of this more than just what's on the surface. Look at Luke chapter number 4, verse number uh, 16. So as we know, there are multiple synagogues. Just so you know a little background history, there are multiple synagogues. There's one temple, right? Multiple synagogues, one temple. So uh, Luke chapter number 4, verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for, to read. So what are they going to read? What are they sitting in the synagogue to read? They're sitting in their synagogue reading the scriptures. Okay, so let's just think about this for a second. Uh, did they all have the same scriptures? Yes, via what? Via copies of the scripture, right? They had been making copies of them. And so here's a great example of it. Well, well, are they good scriptures? Were they good? Oh, maybe man made a mistake, and maybe there's going to be an error. Maybe God didn't preserve his word. Well, this example shows you right here that he did preserve it, and that this is, this is Christ showing you his endorsement of it, and then the validity of it. He says here, read this. He says in verse 17, There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So he knew that where this place was going to be written about a prophecy, and so he reads it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 61, he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. Just think about that for a second. Just picture that in your mind, what just took place. Stand up to read, gets the scripture, reads the portion of Isaiah, and then he sits down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened right on him. What's everybody doing? They're just looking right at him like, okay. Like, you know, you know how they used to do? Basically, if you read what Paul and, and Barnabas were doing, they would go in the synagogue and anybody would say, if any man has any exhortation, you know, say on, basically. Anybody got anything to say about that? Like, it's kind of like we read the scripture and then somebody can exhort on that particular piece of scripture. So what do they do? They just look at him and he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. What's he saying? That prophecy back then was truth. It was promised. Here it is. Did he say, Isaiah kind of made a mistake. He really meant to say this, but no. No. He goes to this synagogue, multiple synagogues with multiple scriptures, grabs the scriptures, opens them up, finds Isaiah 61, and what's he do? The biggest fallacy is that Satan wants you to be like, you can't have a Bible, you don't know it, you can't find anything. And why is that? Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, right? That's the problem. What are you instructed to do? Preach applicable principles. Preach the word. Paul says, y'all speak the same thing. You can't speak the same thing if there's 27 different Bibles in the room. It's a huge problem. Go into a church service. I love going. I, when I know somebody comes to Bible study that has a particular Bible, I go to verses that they don't have. Why would you not do that? Then they're like, what do you say? I, I, I'm waiting for the day when somebody goes... Can you tell me that? What, wait, wait, what, what verse was that? You know? They're like, oh, wait, you don't have that one? Why don't you have, and just bring it up, why don't you have that one? I would play dumb. Why don't you have that one? You know, oh, let me see your Bible. Oh, man, you probably should go get another one. Just make them go get another one. And then they'll bring the next one. Man, that one's missing it, too? You should call the publisher. Call the publisher about that, because mine has it. What do you think the publisher's going to say? I don't care. You got your money. You bought two of them, sucker. Right? So Jesus Christ, what did he do? He didn't, he didn't correct it. He, didn't, he wasn't like, oh, let me correct this Bible thing. 
God has always made His Word known. From the first days in the garden, in His communion, in His discussion about words, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. We have communication, we have dialogue. To the giving of the law, which is their understanding among the nations, and the rest of the nations would look and say, man, wow, that God is pretty awesome. He tells you everything to do. There's not a single thing you guys don't know what to do. Got a question? Look at your law. It's huge. It's the most expansive one. Then to the prophets, when they totally disregard the law, what should we do? What do you think you should do? You had a covenant with God. You better get right. That's why you're sitting here. That was their issue all along. God communicates effectively and consistently His Word throughout Scripture. It's not like, oh, He just magically stopped communicating. Okay, no more communication. We're done. No more Bibles. No more Scripture. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 1 with me. Jeremiah chapter number 1 is very similar to how Peter operates in Acts chapter number 1. As a what? Is, is, is Peter acting as the role of a prophet? He is. He's communicating to them the prophecies of Joel. He says, look guys, this is what's happening right, right now. This is it. You better watch out. But look at Jeremiah chapter number 1 verse 7. Uh, we'll, look, we'll look at verse number 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, so this is the word that comes unto who? Unto Jeremiah. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ha, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So God here communicates his word through what? A person, an individual that we would call a prophet. A prophet named Jeremiah. And he went out and he faithfully communicated these words. He communicated those words to correct bad prophecy in Jeremiah chapter number 29. The one that I always discuss, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, right? For I know the plans I have for you. He's correcting the bad prophecy. He's saying that's not the one you need to listen to. Listen to the right prophecy. I'm the right prophet from God. He actually goes through and discusses the perversion of God's word through the false prophets and the perversion of God's word from those that disregard it and change it. But in Jeremiah chapter number 36... There comes a point in time in which God wants what? He wants the word to be recorded down in writing. He's like, let's get this thing in writing. Okay? Let's write it down so we have a hard copy of it. Jeremiah chapter number 36. Verses 1 through 4, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord. So again, more words from the Lord saying what? Take thee a roll of a book and write therein... All the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Man, that's a lot of words. He probably made a bunch of mistakes. Probably couldn't have done it. How are you going to remember all those words? You're not going to get it right. You're going to screw up. Verse 3, It may be the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do them that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Moriah. And Baruch wrote from the mouth, oh great, now we're getting another guy involved in this? Man, this thing's just never going to be right, is it? Let me think about that for a second. And I got the word of the Lord telling Jeremiah what to write, and Jeremiah tells Baruch what to write. Right? And Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord. Kind of how Tertius wrote the book of Romans. Paul communicated it to him, he dictated it to him, and he wrote it down, right? Which he had spoken unto him upon the roll of the book. You know what's really cool, though, is this book gets destroyed. So we don't have the original copy of this one. If you look at verse number 27, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. After that, the king had burned the roll, and the words which Brooke wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, And what does he say? That's okay, make a copy of it. I can preserve my word. I can take care of it. Can't he? You know, if you read Job chapter number 38, and just go through that passage for a second. The, the very, one of the words he says, just I'll, I'll read you the first verse of Job 38. He says, then the, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? 
It's like, hold on a second. Words without knowledge. Let me go ahead and tell you something. And he goes through and he, bam, he just lays it down. And when he lays that down there in, jo in Job chapter 38, it's just like, start, start looking at those questions that he's going through there. It's like, who, who takes care of the clouds? And who holds up the rain? And who puts the, the, the hail up there? And, he, and you're just like, okay, wow, okay, hold on a second, yeah. And do you understand how that all works? And can you figure that all out? And you're, you're realizing that your understanding is, whew, nothing compared to what God's understanding is. And so true understanding, we've always said, you read the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul just discusses, like, man, the stuff that I used to know, man, that's just a waste. It's the stuff, the true understanding, true knowledge is the spiritual wisdom that we get through the word of God. So again, copies are nothing new. Uh, Acts chapter 15, we talked about the discussion of, of making copies in the synagogues. In Acts chapter 15, verse 21, it says, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Well, how do they do that? With copies. And keep in mind here, we don't have any printing presses. We don't have any, you don't have like a Word document. Oh, yeah, what do you need? You need uh, uh, Genesis, Genesis 1 through 4? Yeah, I'll, sh I'll shoot you over that DocX via email. They're not doing that. They're making handwritten copies of it, right? And, and you know that Timothy, he had the scriptures as a child. Um, you know, it was really God's, God's uh, purpose and role and desire for, for Paul to not only fulfill the word of God in, in a sense of him going through and doing it, but then also fulfilling it in the, in the outpour of it, in the preaching of it, so that, that he may make it fully known among those Gentiles. So why is God's word so important? Let's just close with a few things here. Number one, we are made alive by God's word. Aren't we? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he quickened us. He makes us alive Look at uh, John chapter number 6, verse 63. When uh, Christ is communicating here in John chapter 6, it's funny because the disciples are like, this is a hard saying. <laughs> Who can hear it? This is, this is hard. It's hard to digest. Christ says in verse, verse uh, 63 of John 6, It is the spirit that quickeneth, makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. There's no profit in the flesh. Paul tells you that. He says it as well. He says what? My flesh lieth no good thing. It's a waste of time. With, you know, if you're in the flesh, you can't please God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God, right? So without faith, it's impossible to please him. That's in Hebrews and Romans chapter 8. And he says the following, uh, the flesh profit nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. Why? Because they come from Christ. And they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And why did they do that? They wanted food. That's what it really came down to. If you read the understanding here, the passage, they were all hungry. Like, oh, you've been doing all these miracles. We want some more. Feed us again. Then he looks at who? Jesus looks at the 12, and he says, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And then he tells you what those words of eternal life are, and he says... And we believe and are sure that thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. So we understand that you're made alive by the words. Christ communicates unto you the words there. The gospel of the kingdom concerns itself with that. But just like Paul says that what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So not only are we supposed to do that, we're also supposed to then live by the words of God. Matthew chapter 4, Christ says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you didn't have those words, what are you going to what are you gonna live on? How are you going to really operate? How are you going to renew that new man? How are you going to be built up and established in sound doctrine? And again, here Christ is quoting back to the Old Testament. And then finally and ultimately, we're, we're instructed to preach the word, not principles, not ideas, not whatever guidelines. Look at uh, First, Tim First Thessalonians chapter number 2.
this is a this is a prime example of how this uh, how this actually works. You, you put it into the shoe leather here. Uh, we'll read verse 13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are, excuse me, in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own country, even as they have of the Jews. So all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's persecution on both sides of the fence. Verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to do what? Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. How, does pe how do people get saved? I mean, I want to get saved. How do we get saved? You commu communicate unto them the gospel of their salvation. And when they hear the gospel of their salvation, they have a choice. They're, they're faced with a decision. You can be like many, which say, like, my, like the friend that we were talking about earlier, I want to believe my mind just won't let me. Or, what happens? You get the word and you just keep digging deeper and deeper in there, and all of a sudden, just man, they're just getting hit. It's getting cutting them open. It's just doing, you're doing the spiritual surgery left and right, and just cutting them right open. Every time that I've ever been in a discussion in which I quote the Bible, we have problems. It always happens. My buddy Todd said he was talking to one of his friends at work, and uh, the guy kept going, you know, you're just quoting too much Bible. That should be the, uh, that should be, that should be what everybody says to you. You're quoting too much Bible, because what does that do? It makes them uncomfortable. It really gets them into the position where they go, oh, I don't like it. I don't like it. Stop it. Because it's not you saying it. You're just faithfully being a minister of the word. And when you do it in the right spirit with the right manner of motivation so that people can get saved and you can reconcile people, it, it is helpful to them. It's that spiritual surgery. It's funny, fitting, because he works in surgery. And we were joking about that back and forth. So again, you, you preach that, what? The word and the word of faith, as Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 8, right? That word of faith is nigh. It's even in your mouth and your heart. The word of faith which we, have, which we preach, right? I love how Hebrews 4, 2, another one you can look up later. Word saves if it's not mixed with the faith, right? And without scripture that is perfect and errant, we have nothing with which to place our faith in. I mean, really, you don't. What are you going to believe in? Think about that for a second. Without a scripture you don't believe is perfect and inerrant, what are you trusting in? If God can do all this that you see around you, even his eternal Godhead and power so that without excuse, you're not you're gonna tell me that he can't he can't maintain a book? I was watching a thing about the human brain the other day. I won't get into it. Most ridiculous thing ever. I mean, I was listening to these guys talk about evolution of the human brain, but I just I literally was like, you guys are just a bunch of fools. I mean, how do you how do you see that whole thing? And, and you, when they they had a, they were dissecting it and going through it, I'm like, there's nothing there. It's just a bunch of you know, fatty tissue there. I digress. Anyways, uh, last last passage of scripture. Uh, look at John chapter number twelve. John chapter number twelve. The play on words is what the play on words ultimately about the word is. The word is who. The word is Christ. That's the play on words. That's always there. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, not a God. Right? And the word was manifest among us, right? But look at uh, John chapter number 12. John chapter number 12. Look at verse number 48. John chapter number 12, verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. And as you know from our study, what is all, who, is, who has all judgment been uh, given to? All judgment has been given to the Son. The man whom he, he hath ordained to be the judge, and he says, hath one that judgeth him. Who, what judges him? The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. You know, I, I just, I, I find it simply incredible 
that people do not see the devices and tactics of Satan. How do you not see it? How do you not see how he operates? Don't you see what he does? He makes this thing as confusing as he possibly can. Let's, not, let's, let's try to, you know, the, the, the thing, I, I'll say one more story, and I, and I hate to do this, but it's important. A friend of mine had a, had a post, and it was all about this John 3.16 thing. He has John 3.16 all over saying, this guy's a, he's a flaming Roman Catholic. I mean, this guy is just, he's as Roman Catholic as, as he can possibly be. But he looks at John 3.16, and he uses that as his verse. That's the verse, right? And I've had some discussion with him, and the problem is he's just all over the place. But how fitting is it for, for Satan to say, well, let's pick a verse like John 3.16. Let's publicize it really heavily, and let's make people just think, you know, we'll just believe that. And that's, that sounds good, you know? And he always says, I believe in God. Thanks for blessing me. That's his big thing. You know, he posts Facebook statuses all the time. Uh, and it's just, it's sad, because that's what it comes down to. They'll, they'll take the one verse, they'll hop on it, they'll never, they'll never move on to another one. If you have the true understanding of what is there, do we have, do we have the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in John chapter 3, verse 16? It's not there. It doesn't exist. I always go to the first Timothy chapter number one, you know. All right, I digress, I digress. Anyways, I, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, you can get some of the, the, hopefully Pastor Russ has some of those um, the little handouts. I, I probably have a few more. I can make copies of them. Yeah, I need, need a reprint of those. I passed them out to some guys, some friends of ours that, ha that, that wanted them. And it's just, it's just helpful. Some of those things are, are, again, it's cool to have it all in one little place you can turn to and flip through. All right, let's close in a word of prayer.